everyone, and welcome to another presentation for Reptile and Amphibian Days. We are so excited that you are joining us here with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. My name is Miranda Dowdy, and I'm an educator here at the museum. And before we get started, um, I want to hear from you in the chat. So um, down there in the YouTube chat, I want to hear, you know, we're talking about snakes today. So have you seen a snake this year so far? Um, I know it's been a little bit cold. Um, and if you haven't seen a snake this year, did you see a snake last year? And do you know what it was? So our expert today um, is gonna be telling us about some snakes that you um, might see around here, the Raleigh area. If you're not from Raleigh, then maybe you see some of these snakes from where you live. Um, if not, you're gonna learn a few things about what we get to see, um, lucky enough. And so with that, I want to introduce our speaker. Um, so Bonnie Emick is the head of Prairie Ridge Eco Station for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. If you've never been there, it is also right here in Raleigh, um, just off of Blue Ridge Road in between Blue Ridge Road and Edwards Mill Road. And it is a wonderful place to go and see wildlife and visit the prairie and take a hike. And if you want to look at some wild snakes, then it's probably a good place. And Bonnie gets to see um, some friends all the time. So Bonnie, welcome and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited to share all about one of my favorite groups of animals and they don't get enough love. So I'm really excited to share them with you. Um, so are we ready to go? I think we're ready to go. All righty. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk about snakes of Raleigh, like Miranda said. Um, so in general, these are really could be snakes of Wake County and surrounding areas. And a lot of these snakes you can see across North Carolina and the Southeast United States. But we're going to focus on Raleigh just because that's where Prairie Ridge and the museum are. Um, so first, what are snakes? They are legless reptiles. So we're learning about reptiles and amphibians all week this week. Um, reptiles, they have the same characteristics as all the other reptiles. They have scales. They do have bones. Some people don't think that snakes have bones because they're just really long and very wiggly, but they actually have bones. They don't have any legs. So they don't have any claws. Other reptiles have claws. I think if snakes had feet, they'd probably have claws. Um, but most of them are also egg layers. And they are also, you might call it cold-blooded, but the science term is ectothermic. So they depend on um, the surrounding temperature to heat or cool them. So lately they've been hiding a lot because it's been pretty cold outside. And as it warms up, they'll come out um, in sun. You'll often see them out sunning. Um, and so as we get warmer this week, I really think I might see my first snake this year. I haven't seen one yet this year. Um, but my coworker has. So um, hopefully you'll get to see some snakes soon. We're gonna talk about how to identify them. So when you do see them, hopefully you'll remember them or you'll know where to go look on how to look them up. So some more fun snake facts is I mentioned they have scales. So they are actually not slimy. They are scaly and their scales cannot produce slime. Sometimes they look shiny um, and they might be wet um, but they themselves are not slimy. When they grow, they have to shed their whole skin to grow. So they grow their brand new skin underneath their old skin. And when that new skin is ready, they kind of peel their whole skin off in one piece if they can. They don't have any arms to itch, help itch off. So they'll rub on rocks or wood or around trees. And sometimes it breaks off in pieces, but they try and crawl out of the whole thing. There's also a scale over their eye so you can see in this picture here, this snake has also shed the scales over his eyes. Snakes stick out their forked tongue as a way to learn about their surroundings. So it's kind of like tasting the air. They have a forked tongue. So when they stick it out, they can sense on either the left or the right or in the middle if there's something that's straight ahead of them. And then they have a Jacobson's order uh, organ inside their um, mouth so they can sense the air. So if they are hunting, for example, they're looking for mice, they can sense if the mouse is on the left or on the right, which is a really cool way to hunt. All snakes are carnivores. They all have to eat some other animal or eggs. 
Um, so to do that, because snakes heads are pretty small and their prey are pretty big, they actually unhinge their jaws or, or kind of have a double hinge on their jaws. So they can actually open their mouth really, really wide. Their teeth are um, facing backwards. So they move their jaw back and forth as their teeth shove their food into their mouth so they can eat because they can't use their hands to do that. Is really, really cool. And this is how they can eat something that's rounder than them. So the snakes I see at Prairie Ridge, they're often eating rats that are a little bit bigger than they are normally around, or even eggs. And you probably heard of a different phrase, but I'm going to say that the only good snake is a live snake for so many reasons. They're part of the ecosystem um, and they control rodent populations, which is really good, especially in our fields, our crop fields. Um, and on these rodents, there's also fleas and ticks. So they're eating lots and lots of fleas and ticks. Um, for example, I found uh, somewhere on the internet that timber rattlesnakes can consume 3,000 or more ticks in a year. That's great news to me. Um, so that's really, really beneficial. Um, these rodents in our crop fields, they could be eating our crops. Of course, they're pooing our crops. So it's really healthy to have snakes there to help control that population so that less of our crops are spoiled. And even venomous snakes can be important to research. So we're, our researchers are looking at copperhead venom as being used in things like breast cancer research. So Bonnie, before we um, move on, um, when we were talking about how you know snakes don't have any legs, um, but those are not the only reptiles or amphibians that don't have legs. So can you um, tell us the difference, not only between, I know there are legless lizards, can you tell us what the differences are between a snake and a legless lizard? And actually, um, M in the YouTube chat asked, what is the difference between snakes and limbless salamanders, which um, we know exist too. And so can you maybe the difference between a salamander and a, you know, a reptile because salamanders yes. are amphibians. Those are Excellent questions and good point because there is a legless lizard that is not a snake. So lizards can blink. They can wink at you really. Snakes cannot, they don't have eyelids. Um, so that's one big difference. And also ears, there's little ear holes on legless lizards and snakes don't have um, actual holes there. So there is a legless lizard that does live in North Carolina and it, does, it doesn't have any, any uh, legs but it can blink and it's got little holes up, up where if he had sticky out ears where those would be. Um, and amphibians don't have scales. They have a uh, smoother skin and uh, kind of a slimier skin, some of them. Um, and there are uh, legless or very tiny toed type, like toes type of uh, amphibians as well. Um, so yeah, great questions, good points. So I've used the word venomous a couple times already, and I know some people will call them poisonous snakes, but there is a difference in that word. And I just wanted to um, share that just in case you didn't know that um, poisonous involves something you eat or absorb or ingest. So hopefully nobody's eating a frog, but the reason why there are poisonous frogs is because they excrete a poison that if you were to ingest that, it could make you sick. Um, same thing with mushrooms. If you ate a poisonous mushroom, that could make you sick. Venomous means it has to be injected into you or poked into you. Um, so a snake bite, the teeth are poking into you, or even a bee sting um, that's injecting into you. So that's the difference between poisonous and venomous. So when I talk about venomous snakes, it's because these particular snakes happen to have a venom in their teeth. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that too. Um, and, you know, venomous snakes, they do pose a little bit more danger to us because if we accidentally step on one and we get bitten, it's going to be worse than if we accidentally step on a uh, non-venomous snake. However, venomous snakes are not inherently bad. They are also part of the ecosystem and their venom is used for hunting. So the way that venomous snakes hunt is they will, they're ambush predators, first of all, they're camouflaged, so they stand or they sit very, very still. And when their prey comes by, they'll bite them and inject some venom. And then they wait for their prey to slow down and then they can go get them and eat them. 
Most other snakes, the, most of the bigger snakes are constrictors, so they don't use venom in their teeth. They are also ambush and they'll grab and immediately squeeze their prey. So venomous snakes have venom primarily for hunting, for eating their own food. It is also a defense, um, but the first line of defense for most snakes, especially um, some venomous snakes in our area, their first line of defense is camouflage. We're gonna see some photos in just a little bit where you can see and imagine how camouflage they would be. The point of camouflage is that you're hidden, so you stay really still. If you're wearing camouflage and you're running around the woods, people are gonna see you. So you sit really, really still. That's their first line of defense. Their second line of defense is actually to get away from you, the other direction. If they feel like they're cornered and they feel like they can't get away, they may give other warning signs like shaking their tail like a rattlesnake does, and non-venomous snakes will do this too. They might rear up their head to show you they mean business. They're only gonna bite if they feel like it's the last resort. You're a big giant compared to them and they can't eat you. So they don't really wanna waste their venom. They don't really wanna get close to you to bite you because you're bigger. Um, but unfortunately, you know, if you, if you do corner them or you accidentally step on them, they do have uh, that venom as defense, but that's not the main reason for their venom. How to tell venomous snakes from non-venomous venomous snakes. And this is true for snakes in our area specifically. Um, and it, it takes some uh, getting used to looking at some of these snakes. So the top picture here is just a generic water snake, um, which we do uh, have a number of species of water snakes that are non-venomous. Their eyes, their pupils are round um, versus this, in this example, cotton mouth, this eye is not round, it's elliptical, it's more like a cat eye. Um, and their snouts are also rounded versus this venomous snake where the snout is kind of turned up a little. Those are a little subtle, the snout's a little subtle distance that you really have to kind of get to know these snakes to, to see that. But um, sometimes you can see the eye. I don't recommend getting up really close to look into their eyes. Maybe you can take a photo from a distance and then zoom in. That would be the safest way. It is true that venomous snakes have more of a triangular head. I know a lot of people tell me, oh, that's how you tell. That is true. You can see that uh, kind of the back end into their jaw, or their head is um, definitely a lot wider compared to this snake. However, some non-venomous snakes can also flare out their head as a defense. Remember I said they use camouflage and then they might give you a warning. They might actually puff out their head as a way to trick you, which isn't a bad thing because probably you're gonna go, wow, I'm not gonna touch that snake because I'm really not sure. So it's a great defense. And this last one, you're probably, I do not advise catching a snake to flip it over, especially to see if it's venomous or not. But this is true and it's kind of a fun fact. So on non-venomous snakes, if you flip them over, this is the tail end. The vent is a place, there's a hole there. A lot of people ask me, where do snakes poo from? And if they're females that lay eggs, where do they lay eggs from? Well, it's from this vent area and this is towards the last part of their, the end of their body. So from the vent and towards the tail, if there are two rows of scales here, then that's a non-venomous snake. If there's one row of scales past the vent, then it's venomous. However, again, I do not advise picking up a snake to look on their underside to determine these things. And all of these features, you know, you, you do have to get a little close, get a good view. So the best thing to do is to take a photo and zoom in or learn about their color patterns, which I'm gonna go over in just a second and how you can see these things, these features from farther away. So Bonnie, um, before we move on away from uh, venomous, can you tell us, um, you know, we have um, someone in the, in the chat asked, is viper another name for a venomous snake or are vipers a specific group of snakes? And so I know that there are at least two major groups of venomous snakes and uh, maybe you can tell us which one we see the most of around here as we move on to this next slide. Yeah, so there are, and you probably think vipers like cobras. We don't have any cobras around here, um, but we do have some snakes that are called pit vipers. And I do apologize that I did not uh, read up specifically on that because I don't talk about vipers specifically a whole lot. I, I mostly talk about uh, how to identify the snakes and how they use their venom. Do you know? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, Bonnie and I actually partnered on this um, presentation a little while ago. So um, Viper versus a lapid is really um, ways of, and, you know, delivering the venom. And so when we think of a Viper, that's what we think of, um, you know, of like a rattlesnake that has those really, those two big fangs kind of in the front that they inject into someone. Um, whereas a lapis, you're thinking of um, more of a rear fang intoxication, right? And so um, something, um, we do have one alapid um, that Bonnie, I think we'll mention later, the cor Eastern coral snake, um, which is kind of gonna chew on their prey to inject that venom more so than um, kind of, um, with the needles and injecting it that way. So, um, so yeah, most of, our, um, I think Bonnie mentioned, we have six venomous snakes, five of our venomous snakes are vipers and, um, and, and yeah, and, uh, yeah. So, uh, that's, that's that. So they are a different, a specific group of venomous snake, but there are multiple groups of venomous snakes. Awesome. Thank you, Miranda. I should have said that I'm not actually a herpetologist, but I do know a little bit, a lot about snakes. So thanks, Miranda. Um, so the first snake we're going to talk about uh, is the copperhead. Now in Wake County, this is going to be the most common venomous snake that you see. It's almost the only venomous snake that you'll see. We have one other venomous snake that could appear in parts of Wake County. Um, but of the six total venomous snakes in North Carolina, most of them don't even live in North Carolina. They are, I mean, sorry, in Raleigh. They live in the mountains or towards the coast. Um, so the copperhead is by far the, the most common one. If you see a venomous snake here in the Raleigh area in Wake, most of Wake County, this is what you're going to see. And there's a couple ways to tell them apart. Now, I mentioned his eyes, but look at this picture. You really have to look closely to see that, yes, their eyes, the pupil's not round, it's elliptical. Um, but that's kind of hard to see. These photos were all taken from a safe distance. Um, so to be from a safe distance, you might not be close enough to see that. Um, their head is kind of triangular, but not as distinct as you would think. Um, and of course, I'm not gonna flip this snake over to look at its underside. So the best way to identify these snakes is to know their patterns. So on copperheads, they're all this kind of brown, there's, you know, there's uh, varying shades of brown, but they all have this pattern on their side. Can you imagine a Hershey kiss here? If you look from the top, it might look like an hourglass. Um, so that is pretty consistent. This one on the right is a baby copperhead and it still has the Hershey kiss pattern, which is really great. It's, it's easy to identify it that way. Young copperheads also have this green tail. They shake in the grass and they try and uh, attract um, prey that way too, to kind of trick them. Some other snakes in our area that look like copperheads, um, but that are not venomous include this corn snake. You can see he also has spots, but they're not really Hershey kisses. Um, this snake also tends to be more orange, but sometimes if you just see him out of the corner of your eye, they could be more brown, copperheads could appear a little bit more orange. Um, so this snake does not have those distinct uh, Hershey kisses. If you look really close, this snake also has a round pupil. Again, that's harder to see. The Northern water snake is also one that gets uh, confused for copperheads. And they also have these blotches on them that not quite, even these ones, not quite Hershey kisses, definitely a round eye. Um, but they also look a lot like copperheads. My recommendation is if you see any snake at all and you're just, especially these ones, you're just not sure, is that a Hershey kiss? Is that a elliptical eyeball? The best thing to do is leave them alone. All wild animals could defend themselves, which could be in the form of a bite. You don't wanna get bitten by anything anyways. But again, take a picture and look it up later to see what you saw. The other venomous snake that you may see in parts of Wake County, um, very rare, is the cottonmouth. Most of the time, if you see a snake in the water in Wake County, it's not going to be a cottonmouth. But these other uh, non-venomous snakes kind of look like them too. So the cottonmouth, it's also called the water moccasin, uh, has these dark blotches. They can get really dark and almost appear black as well, and you almost can't see their spots. They do live in the water. And when they feel threatened, they'll just open their mouth really wide and you can see that the white in their mouth makes it look like they've got cotton in their mouth, just how they got their name. Um, so these could be found, I know I work with somebody who said they've seen them in Southeast Wake County. 
Um, but most, I've never seen one in Raleigh. Um, most of the time you're not actually seeing cottonmouth, but our adjacent counties um, can definitely see cottonmouths um, in, in the water. Some other water snakes that we have are the Northern water snake. Um, and again, their head, you can't see the eyes on this guy, but his eyes are round versus elliptical pupils. Um, and the color is a little bit different as well, and their heads are a little bit different. So again, if you see the snake, just don't, don't grab it, just to be sure, take a picture. Red belly water snakes are also in our area. These are pretty distinct. They're pretty plain colored on the back with a bright orange red, uh, orange red chin there. These snakes I see um, fairly often, especially down like in Wendell um, in that area. Um, and I've seen these snakes actually come out pretty far from the pond. They specialize in eating tadpoles and toads and frogs. So I've seen these snakes come up out of the water pretty far hunting toads, um, which is uh, really kind of, really kind of cool. By far the most common snake I see ever um, in all of my hiking around are this group of black snakes. Now these are different species of snakes, but they all look really similar. So I hear a lot of people just kind of generally call them black snakes. Um, so I'm gonna describe the difference between these different species here. Um, the rat snake, sometimes called the Eastern rat snake is by far the one I see the most. This snake is mostly plain, has a white chin, when they're young, as in this picture on the right, they do have spots. They're kind of gray with some spots. So sometimes the older rat snakes, you can still kind of see the spots underneath the darker skin. These snakes can get up to five, six feet long. They're excellent climbers. So I've seen them climbing up trees. They like to go up and eat eggs. And they're pretty, a pretty docile snake. Um, by the way, none of these are venomous. Um, when I come across a rat snake, a lot of times they just kind of freeze and look at me and wonder if I'm going to keep hiking. Um, so they, uh, they definitely freeze and they don't pose any danger at all, unless you go grab them, which I don't recommend. Racers on the bottom, uh, they look very similar. Rat snakes have um, keeled scales, so they have like each little scale has like a bump on it, like the bottom of a boat, and racer scales are smooth. Um, which is really hard and to see until you really see a bunch of them. The main difference is racers, they get their name because they're really fast. Most of the time I come across a racer, it's because he's already doom, slithered off before I can barely see. Maybe I see his tail tucking into the leaves. So sometimes they'll freeze, but most of the time these guys are quicker to get away from me. Um, and that's usually how I see racers. Another group of snakes, another species of snakes that is black is the Eastern King Snake. These are black with these white stripes on them, and these are really cool snakes. They're called King Snakes. They can, they're like the king of the snakes. They can actually eat other snakes, including venomous snakes like copperheads. They're immune to their venom. So that's a really cool snake to have around. All of these are collectively referred to as black snakes a lot of the times because they all kind of look the same, especially if you only catch a glimpse of them, um, but they are different species. If you live farther in Eastern North Carolina, the rat snake might be a yellowish snake or a greenish rat snake. Um, and uh, they might not be specifically the black rat snake, but they're all the same species. Some researchers are looking to see if they're subspecies as each other as well. And in Eastern North Carolina, you might also call that rat snake a chicken snake because they get in the chicken coops to eat the eggs. Some other non-venomous snakes that I see commonly around Raleigh and Wake County area include the rough green snake. Um, that's a bright green snake. So I've been mentioning that they rely on camouflage. So these snakes live up in the treetops where the leaves are green. So I don't often see this snake because I don't hang out in the treetops. But when they do come down to either travel to another tree or to look for insects on the ground, um, that's when I see them. So I usually only see one or two rough green snakes a year. These guys are specialized in eating insects. Um, these are really, really, you can see um, by the size of this person's hand, this is a very long, thin snake. So they eat insects. The Eastern garter snake is probably what 
uh, you often might have heard of it as a garden snake, but there's not a garden snake, it's actually garter. But they are found in your garden, so that could be a little confusing. Um, so these three snakes are actually all snakes that I have seen in garden beds. When you're mulching, when you're planting new plants like you're probably getting ready to do, these are snakes that you might accidentally turn up in your mulch or your leaf litter. Um, these are all small snakes, this brown snake and this ring neck snake around, uh, along with the eastern garter are all these small snakes that are in your garden beds or in the leaf litter of the woods, eating insects and slugs, earthworms, that sort of thing. So these are really great to help keep some, to keep some of the pest species down from your garden that might be there trying to eat your plants. And then here's some other little brown snakes that you see quite often in our garden beds. Um, the red belly snake, the rough, and smooth earth snakes and the worm snake. The worm snake is pretty distinct because he's got a pink belly all the way down. Um, but a lot of these other little brown colored snakes are a little harder to tell apart. The big thing to know here, if you're trying to identify a little snake in your garden is, do you see any uh, Hershey kisses and hourglasses on them? None of them have that. Neither did the ones on these other slides. So, Copperhead babies, remember, they still have the Hershey kiss or the hourglass on their pattern. And that is the most common snake that you're gonna see, venomous snake that you're gonna see in the Raleigh area. None of these have that pattern, so these are non-venomous. The best thing to do when you see these is just kind of let, let them be. They're probably gonna be pretty shocked if you're gardening that you've uncovered them. Um, so they're probably gonna be really eager to slither away and hide again. They don't like to be out in the open a whole lot. Um, but like I said, these are really beneficial to have in your garden as well. Now, if you're the kind of person who likes snakes and would like to attract snakes to your yard, here's some tips that you can do. You can provide shelter, such as stick piles. Um, if you have a wood pile, that's a, a place that a snake might hide. Um, why are they there? It's shelter and there might be food to eat. So especially these smaller snakes that eat insects, might be there because there's insects in your wood pile. So food and shelter. Um, if you have a water source nearby, um, snakes also need to drink water. So they might be there as well. And if you want to be a friend to snakes in your yard, and this will help for other species too, is to try and avoid spreading chemicals. There's no chemical that really deters snakes. However, if you're spraying for something like insects or uh, herbicides or anything like that, that, the things that are eating the plants um, are the same things that the snakes are eating. So if the insects are eating plants that have herbicide on them, then essentially the snakes would be eating that too. So if you're interested in being a friend to snakes and other animals, if you can avoid using chemicals, uh, we advise it, but sometimes we understand it's pretty hard. So just be very selective on how you do that. And if you have really long grass, that's a great place for a snake to hide. And if you don't want to hit them with that lawnmower, the best thing to do is to kind of walk around your yard, put on some closed toed shoes and walk around your yard before you mow the lawn. Um, sometimes they'll freeze because remember first reaction camouflage, they're going to freeze. But after you walk away, most of the time those snakes are going to go, wow, that was a close call and they're going to get out of the way. Alternatively, if you don't want snakes in your yard, and I understand a lot of people probably don't want snakes in their yard for different reasons. Make sure you don't have stick piles right up near your house. If you have a wood pile, put it farther away from the house. Um, keep your lawn mowed if you don't want things hiding in the grass. Um, and um, I still advise avoiding chemicals because that helps the other things too. Some more resources to learn more about snakes. So I went over the most common snakes that I see in Raleigh. I did not go over every snake that you can see in Raleigh. Um, and there are 36 species of snakes in North Carolina. So if you don't live in Raleigh, I still didn't go over all the snakes that are in your area. Um, so definitely check out the website herpsofnc.org. Herps because herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. So that's a really great resource to see photos of snakes. So when you took your picture, you can compare your picture to what's online. And the great thing about this website is it's specific to North Carolina. So if you took a picture in Wake County, it actually has a little map of the counties that each species of snake is in. 
So if you think you saw a coral snake, but it's not appearing in Wake County, I think that's true. <laughs> I just picked it out as an example. Um, you probably didn't see that. Um, or if you saw a timber rattler, but you're not, in, and you took it in Wake County, you probably didn't see that. So you've got uh, the, the maps in that website as well. Partners in Amphibian and Reptiles Converse, Conservation Park is a great place to learn more about how you can um, attract or be a friend to uh, reptiles and amphibians in your yard to play, um, plan habitat for them. Um, so that's a, another really great resource for that. And another way to help identify your photos of your reptiles that you've taken, of anything you've taken a photo of, is iNaturalist or the Seek app. On these apps, you can take a photo and upload it, and it'll give you an idea of what they um, what they think that species is. Um, and then you can, on iNaturalist, you can upload it with the location, and other iNaturalist users can go in and confirm, yes, that is what you saw. Um, and another way to confirm what species of snake you saw is to ask a naturalist here on our museum's website. You can also send photos there and museum staff will actually help you identify um, whatever you have taken a picture of, uh, if, if it's a uh, copperhead or if it's just one of those other snakes that look like copperheads. So with that, I think you probably have some questions. Yep, so we did have a couple questions pop up in the chat. Um, one of them, um, someone wanted to know, do snakes ever live in groups or are they solitary? I do know that some of them do live in groups, especially when it's real cold, you know, mm -hmm. body warmth, they'll all get together. And at Prairie Ridge, um, so there's a couple places around Prairie Ridge where I know uh, during certain times of the day, we'll see two or three snakes all in the same area. They've got plenty of shelter. They've got plenty of food. There's no competition, um, but they're not really um, social per se. So they very often, most of the time I see a snake, it is all by itself. So um, like I said, there's a couple places at Prairie Ridge where I think just the habitat is good and that's where, uh, or the shelter is good. And that's where I see snakes congregate all together. Right. And I know that you mentioned that um, some of the snakes that you showed us today eat a variety of um, of prey, right? They, it's not all like mice or small mice or big mice or big rats or small rats. Um, you know, some eat are lizard eaters, some are snake eaters. Um, and so, you know, obviously, if you're a snake, you probably don't want to be hanging around a king snake because <laughs> an eastern king snake will probably find you a nice snack. Um, and I know that even at the museum, we have these program animals that are behind the scenes. And if I hold, um, you know, an Eastern King snake, and then I try and immediately without washing my hands and scrubbing that smell off of me, if I try to hold another snake, then a lot of times that other snake, that other species is a little bit nervous because they think they, they know that, you know, a predator um, might be near them. And so they can kind of get afraid and stressed out. So we have to be really careful about that. Um, and yeah, we've all seen these pictures of kind of these kind of hibernacula, right? Of Especially I think garter snakes are, are um, a big one where they'll kind of all overwinter in the same um, den. And so you might uncover a den of, you know, 100 garter snakes, depending on where you live. We've seen um, um, some photos online of that, which is which is really interesting. And uh, but yeah probably don't want to be hanging around something that might eat you too, too closely. And like you, and like you said, when there's plenty of food and habitat around, then um, you can see them kind of congregating together. Um, we had another um, question. So, so Maggie wanted to know when the pandemic is over, does the museum have live snake demos where people can have close meetings with snakes? And I know that, um, the answer is yes, right? And I obviously out at Prairie Ridge, you guys don't have your own program animals that you use to show, but people can come and kind of hang out, maybe walk by a snake and observe it from a distance. Um, but at the museum, we do have programs where, um, you know, normally we have daily programs in our um, windows on the world where you can kind of see and observe animals up close. Um, we will start having 
more um, floor programs as we start to open up a little bit more. Of course, we do have live snake exhibits where you can come and get pretty close. They're obviously on the other side of a piece of glass, but you can get close and observe snakes, um, which is really cool. On In our um, Nature Exploration Center, we have our native snakes. And then in the Nature Research Center, we do have some a big display of milk snakes. So you can see the variety of milk snakes, which is really cool. All right, and let's see. Um, so we had a question, what do snakes do in cold weather? And I know a little bit about this, Bonnie. Do you know much about what snakes do in cold weather? They mostly find somewhere to hide and keep warm. Um, our snakes don't do a full hibernation. Um, if there's a really warm winter day, they might actually come out in sun. Um, I see turtles do this more often than the snakes. Our turtles at at Prairie Ridge have been coming out um, of the water more often on as we've had these warmer days. So snakes will come out if it's a little bit warmer to warm up, but they just kind of hunker down. Part of being ectothermic means that you have a slow metabolism. So you don't have to eat every day. You don't have to eat every week. Um, so there's metabolism just slows down and they're able just to find a place to stay warm, stay safe. Um, there are still other predators that could eat snakes out there. So they just find a, a safe place. We don't see them. Sometimes if we're mulching, we might accidentally uncover a snake in the mulch in the winter. And then it's very lethargic because it's so cold. It doesn't have the energy to move. So we make sure to hide it back because <laughs> so, it doesn't really have the energy to get back where it was. Um, but we don't really see them in the winter because they're really good at finding a good place, good place safe to hide for the winter. Awesome. And let's see. Um, so Ed said that they photographed in Florida, they were in Florida and they photographed an albino pygmy rattlesnake and wants to know, do we see any albino snakes in North Carolina? And I have an albino snake story. I don't know if you've ever seen an albino snake, Bonnie. Not in the wild. No. Okay. Well, here's my albino snake story. I wish I had a picture to pull up for you, but, um, so I live in Cary, North Carolina, which is just on the outskirts of Raleigh. And I have a yard that is mostly leaf litter. I have lots of trees in my yard. So I leave a lot of leaf litter in my yard. Um, so anytime um, I can go out and kind of dig through the leaf litter and oftentimes find one of the snakes that Bonnie mentioned, like um, mostly I see worm snakes and um, decays brown snakes in my leaf litter. And I was out there one day moving some stuff around and we uncovered an albino worm snake. It was an adult. Um, so it had, you know, obviously <laughs> lived under the leaf litter safe and sound and, you know, uh, albino snakes and albino animals in the wild are probably, um, more common than we see them, but a lot of them are probably not surviving into adulthood because obviously things like, um, you know, they're colored the way they are for a reason. So if you have tones of brown on, on your backside, or you have a certain pattern, it's because you want to blend in with your environment usually. And so if you are a, a bright white or a pale yellow snake, like this worm snake was, um, and you're trying to blend in with some dead leaf litter and some soil, then it's probably not going to go well for you. Luckily, worm snakes spend most of their time um, you know, underneath the leaf litter and, and, and the earth. And so that's probably how it survived into adulthood. But um, yeah, a lot of times we're not seeing these kind of, um, you know, genetic anomalies um, that are really amazing and cool to see. Like that's a, a super amazing <laughs> find that albino pygmy um, rattlesnake that you found it. Um, but yeah, they're super cool. But that is why we're not seeing them because they're usually, um, you know, if you're you know, I have a hawk that lives in my yard or hangs out in my yard and I see it slurping down little snakes all the time. And so if it saw a little white um, snake wiggling over the over the um, leaves, then it would probably swoop down and grab it really easily. Right. So super, super cool. Find. Thanks for telling us about that. And um, we have someone. Can you how do you tell the difference between a milk snake and a corn snake? And so I don't know if you showed any milk snakes. Money. I I sure. Yeah. Oh, I did not share any milk snakes because I don't, I don't tend to see them um, in, in the area. Milk snakes, um, they're a wide group of, of different types of colors. And so some of them are uh, more spotted um, 
but probably the one you're thinking, I don't know, maybe the one they're, you're thinking over the run, the red touch yellow, kill a fellow that's coral snakes. And then the one where the red does not touch the yellow and that's the milk snake. I don't know if that's what you're thinking, um, but I don't see either one of those uh, very, you know, I've never seen one of those in, in Wake County. Coral snakes don't live in Wake County anyway. Um, so milk snakes are, are tricky. Like I said, I've never seen them. Um, and so I don't know a whole lot about them. The only ones I've seen are at downtown Raleigh <laughs> at the museum. Yeah, and so I think it goes saying like, you know, the best experience is to get out there and, and look at photos and um, make observations, spend time outside um, looking at these things. And, you know, you begin to pick up on those, um, those details a little bit quicker and start identifying things faster. It's amazing that, um, you know, there are groups on Facebook and, and places like that where you can post pictures of snakes from, you know, a really terrible picture from far away. And it's like half the snake. And I'm thinking there's no way anyone's going to be able to figure out what kind of animal, that, what kind of snake this is. It barely looks like an animal in this picture. And you post it on those things. And these people have so much experience looking for, for snakes that they instantly know what it is based on, you know, the body shape or a slight pattern that they see. So it's really amazing just how much um, experience can can matter. Yeah, and I did look that that up just now. Um, milk snakes do live in Wake County. I've just never seen them, so that's why I didn't uh, make my list of common snakes. I hope to see them. Now I really want to see one. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we have, yeah, we actually have a, um, a presentation later later this afternoon um, from someone who has a goal of seeing every um, reptile and amphibian that um, has a record in, in a certain area that he lived in. And so we'll see how many he has found. He's done a good, a pretty good job so far. And so that, you know, what you just did, you looked up where, you know, if we can even find them here. And of course, um, I haven't seen very many of the species that live in my area, but um, you really just have to spend a lot of time outside looking for them. All right. So Kristen said that if She's, if I want to have a water garden for salamanders, frogs, and lizards, but don't want to have snakes, what should I do? And um, I mean, I know that, you know, salamanders, frogs, and lizards don't necessarily need a very big body of water. And a lot of times snakes will want a bigger habitat, right? Because of what their prey is. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, it's hard to <laughs> very specifically say like, I want these reptiles and amphibians, but not these. And um, so you're probably not gonna, you know, depending on how close you are to a body of water, um, you're probably not gonna be getting a lot of, you know, big Northern water snakes or something like that on a small pond on your property. Um, but you might have some things moving through, obviously, um, you know, providing a good habitat for those other things, you know, um, whether it's a little brush pile or, you know, a stack of, wood or um, stones or something like that, you might um, also um, unintentionally attract as, you know, some snakes, whether they are <laughs> living in and around your pond or water feature or not. Um, yeah. And I, I, I should mention, I should have mentioned on the other slide, bird feeders are a thing that could potentially attract snakes because where there are birds, those, some, some snakes might be able to catch a bird um, or where there are bird feeders, um, if the seed falls on the ground and mice or rats are attracted to that, well, snakes eat that too. So yeah, you're, you're right. If you are attracting wildlife, one kind of wildlife, be expected to attract all the wildlife, <laughs> which can be good or bad, you know, so just be thoughtful about where you put that stuff in your yard. I mentioned if you have a wood pile and you don't want the snakes up near your house, Put the wood pile in the back part of your yard. Um, that way, if they're present, at least they're not necessarily right up against the house. Yep. And um, I know, you know, speaking from personal experience, I said that I get a lot of decays brown snakes and worm snakes in my yard. That's by far the most, um, those are the snakes I see the most in my yard. But um, the, the third most snake I see in my yard and the only other species I've found in my yard so far are copperheads. And um, I've Seen, I probably see at least one every summer, if not um, multiple times every summer. Um, I have dogs and I have young children. I usually only see them at night. And a lot of times I see them on the walkway from my car to my house. And so we have to be very careful um, to make sure we're not stepping on it. And so usually, you know, I see it, I get in the house, I maybe tell um, people like, oh, let's not let the dogs out for a few minutes. And 
you know, within 20 seconds, usually I, when I check back, it is completely gone. There's no trace of it. I'm sure it just slid it off under the leaf litter again. Of course, they don't want to be in an interaction with, you know, a big giant scary monster. Like um, I'm sure what I appear to be. So even if I'm like, no, let me get my camera, stay still. So, um, so a lot of times you're not going to see the, a lot of the species that are living there unless you're looking for them. Yeah. And that's a good point. I should mention that when we do see copperheads at Prairie Ridge, um, we leave them alone unless they're in an area where it's going to be a danger to the snake or to our visitors because, you know, accidents can happen. So when we do see a copperhead, we have some long tongs grabbers to get them safely so that we are also safe. And we actually just move them to a different part of the property where they are less likely to encounter humans and you know, they'll just slither away. And I've also had a copperhead at my house on the bottom stair of my deck stairs and my dogs ran past it multiple times. And what did it do? It froze. Um, but I noticed it. I got my dogs inside. I got grabbers that I happened to have at my house and I picked up that snake and I moved him. Um, I put him, I have woods behind my house. So I just put him in the woods behind my house just so, you know, I was lucky that my dogs didn't step on him. But it was really fascinating, even though I know their behavior, to watch my dogs run back and forth. He's literally on the step of my deck and it just, it didn't do anything. Um, so that's good to know too. Yes. You leave them yes. alone, yes. dogs, but also slither away on their own. Yeah. I mean, that's usually when I see the copperheads too, is when I let the dogs out and then I'm like, oh yeah, he's right there on the bottom step of the stairs. <laughs> the dog just ran right over it. And of course, dogs are probably mostly getting bit because, um, you know, they see the snake, they are like, oh, what's this? And they get close and kind of mess with it. I know that one of my dogs found a little brown snake once. And literally when I rescued the poor thing is because my dog was taking his nose and, and like just pushing them into the snake to smell it. And so I'm like, well, you're definitely going to get bit on the face if you ever try to smell a copperhead. But, um, but yeah, and of, and of course, Bonnie, I'm sure that you have been trained to safely move copperheads. And so I think it's important to note that most people when they're, um, when they receive a copperhead bite, you know, it's because they are, you know, trying to move it or um, mess with it in some way, even just <laughs> even, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, want to kill them and that's how they're getting injured. And so the best thing to do is just give it a wide berth. It doesn't want to be around you. Um, I've kind of scooted them off the greenway trail when it's been a nice, warm, busy day. And, you know, I've already passed six or seven people and they're just sitting there like, a bike just drove by me and I'm terrified and I can't move. And so I'll scoot them off the trail. But, um, but yeah, you have to be very, very, very careful um, when you're around them. And of course, the best thing to do is leave them alone. All right. And so um, we have a question. Does the way a snake holds their body help you identify them? Like when racers hold their head up as they move fast. And I know that that's how I identify a black racer usually because, um, you know, usually I'm seeing a black racer or a black rat snake and black rat snakes are usually a little bit more feisty towards me, maybe not at Prairie Ridge because they're used to seeing so many people. But when I come across them, they're like, hey, buddy, what are you doing? You better get away from me. And they're going to sit still and kind of try to intimidate me. Whereas when I see a black racer, usually it's just like a black oil slick, like slithering away as fast as possible. <laughs> so, so are there any yeah, other definitely. ways that you would identify a species like that? I, I agree with that. There's, um, there's been times I've seen racers and that they don't slither away right away and their heads are also held up. They also kind of hunt that way and, and kind of slither away or slither around with their heads raised. Whereas I feel like most of the rat snakes I see don't hold their head up as high as racers when they are casually moving. Um, where you see that snake, where the habitat, what they're doing, definitely all indicators. Most snakes can, I think all snakes can climb, but most, there are some snakes that are going to climb more often, like rat snakes are excellent tree climbers. Racers, I've never seen them climb. I know they can. I know, Miranda, you've seen a copperhead climb. I've never seen a copperhead climb. Um, but in general, you know, the copperheads, they're more camouflage in the leaf litter. Um, so they're going to tend to stay in the leaf litter. Um, and so where, where you see these snakes definitely um, can, can indicate and how they curl up, uh, you know, uh, cotton mouths, they, they like to curl up. It, you've probably seen a picture of that circle and their heads in the middle. Um, I don't know that any other snake does exactly that. I've not seen photos of any other snake doing that as consistently, at least as cotton mouths either. Yeah. And, uh, 
I think those are all like really cool points. Um, and so, yeah, again, like observing and even looking at photographs and videos of snakes can help you kind of determine those things and learn those those things. Um, and I have seen a copperhead um, climbing. I learned for after I saw this observation and um, went into the museum to talk to you know people who know a little bit more about snakes than I do. That copperheads love to eat cicadas, especially after you know a cicada spends most of its life underground. Um, and when they climb out of the ground, they are kind of, um, they don't have wings or anything as so if they have to climb up, molt their exoskeleton. And, um, and that's when they become, you know, the cicada that you think of with the, the, the wings that, and they you know, can fly around and make all the noise. Um, but right after they molt, while they're kind of drying out their new exoskeleton, they're nice and soft and juicy. And so that's when a copperhead really wants them. They're kind of helpless and soft and easier to eat. And so that's what my copperhead was doing. It was climbing. Um, I kind of have like a, a metal wire fence in my yard and it was climbing up that wire fence to look for copperheads and I've actually seen or for uh, cicadas and I've actually seen another copperhead eating a cicada on my walkway, which is really amazing um, to see. So very cool things. I love to observe those kind of things in my yard and I'm excited when I see them. Okay. And someone asked Bonnie, um, what, how do snakes sleep? What do they do when they sleep? And I know that we can't really necessarily tell they're sleeping because one of the ways that we can tell a legless lizard from a snake is that they don't have eyelids. So obviously they're not closing their eyes to sleep, right? Right, exactly. So they're going to find somewhere where they feel safe to go to sleep, first of all. Um, so probably some of the snakes that I come across and they're kind of curled up in the grass, they might be sleeping. I, I don't know. Um, because it's hard because when, like I said, first line of defense is camouflage, they freeze. So are they freezing because they saw me or are they, are they sleeping, <laughs> you know? Um, and I've cared for snakes in, you know, in terrariums and you still can't really tell if they're sleeping or if they're just kind of hanging out. Um, so it's pretty hard, but I will say a snake's not gonna sleep out where he thinks he's gonna be vulnerable um, because there are things that eat snakes. Hawks can eat snakes, other snakes can eat snakes. Um, so, and the smaller snakes, you know, there are other birds that can go eat some of the smaller snakes. So they're going to find someplace pretty safe to sleep. That might be curled up on a branch that might be hidden under the leaf litter or behind a rock or, you know, so yeah, it's pretty hard to tell if that's actually what they're doing though. You're probably not going to come across a snake that's sleeping in the middle of the trail though. Right. <laughs> yeah. Probably have to find, uh, where they're kind of dinning over the other um, if I was a snake, I probably wouldn't, um, you know, choose to sleep in the middle of the road. So I don't think anything really wants to sleep there. Yeah. I had a dog that did once. It was not a good idea. So um, um, Ginger asked, do water snakes have an annual path they travel on? We have a red belly water snake that visits for the frogs in our water garden every year. They stay until they're gone and then the snake leaves. You know, that's a really good question. I don't know if there's any herpetologists that have studied um, if, if they're doing that because they remember, are they sensing it or, you know, they, they or is it a time of year that, you know, they know that the frogs are going to be there and there's going to be food. Do they go, I don't know if there's any researchers that study, well, where do they go after your pond? Do they go to the same next place? Um, so that's a really great, great question to see. I don't, I don't know if anybody does that, but I, I will say I've noticed some of the same behaviors too. So at Prairie Ridge, we have snakes that live on the edge of the woods and in the mornings uh, when it gets warmer. So probably in the next couple of months, we're going to observe this again. They come out of the woods and they slither over to our prairie. We have um, multiple acres of prairie on the edge of the woods. And when they come back in the afternoon, their bellies are kind of chubbier because they found uh, food to eat. So we have cotton rats out there and mice that they have found. And they'll do this not every day because snakes don't have to eat every day, but they do do this multiple times in a season every year. Um, and I've definitely seen uh, red belly water snakes um, frequent the same, you know, go back and forth between different ponds as they go around. So, but I don't know long-term over and, you know, annually, um, if they do the same behavior every year, or is it just opportunistic of, well, this is where the food is and you constantly have food in your pond. It could be that too. Yeah, that's a really cool point. And, um, you know, I think there's always more to learn. And so if, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are, if you're young or if you're old, if you, um, you know, you can always get involved with research and you know, help find these answers. And um, if, 
you know, if you do the research and the answers aren't out there, then maybe you can work with um, someone to figure out how to find out those, those answers. And um, I will say that um, um, Jeff Bean, who is one of the herpetologists who work at the museum ha is done, you know, is currently doing a years long study of um, pine snakes, northern pine snakes that live here in North Carolina in the sand hills. And um, a lot, of, he's found a lot of those snakes um, go back to the same den to overwinter. And so they obviously have some kind of way of finding that den and, you know, creating those habits. And so I wouldn't be surprised to say that, um, you know, your red belly water snake hasn't, you know, created that, that same um, habit and, you know, knowing that, okay, like the frog buffet is open again, let me go hang out there for a few weeks until they're gone. And um, so I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an, a really interesting point and, you know, it would be fun to find out um, the answer. All right, and um, we're almost out of time. Um, I'll quickly, um, someone says they live on a 39 acre lake or snakes in, if snakes are in the lake, do they typically stay at the bottom or on the top of the lake? And I was doing a little bit um, of research on this yesterday that um, as you know, there's been some research done on Northern water snakes and they can stay submerged for up to an hour and a half, but they're probably not like, you know, hanging out down there and like swimming around like mermaids or anything. So <laughs> um, they're usually only under for less than five minutes. And um, that's really just a hunt. And so snakes are going to be really living on the edges of bodies of water. Um, but, you know, a lot of them are hunting for fish and things like that. So they, they will be swimming around a little bit, but they, yeah, they're not hanging out on the bottom or, or anything. So if you do have snakes living there, um, then, you know, quietly walking around the edge of the lake. And um, of course they still have to have habitat around the edges of the lake, whether it's kind of rock piles or stick piles or trees or brush or something like that, some place to kind of hang out and live. Um, they're probably not gonna be like loving a pond or a lake that's just kind of like grass fields all around it. <laughs> so, um, so you might have snakes living around there. Again, it's just kind of quiet observation to, to figure that out. All right. And um, so with that, I know we only have a couple minutes until one o'clock. Let me um, share my slide with you. And so I want to thank you, Bonnie, so much for um, joining us today, telling us about some local snakes that we might see. Um, I hope you all go out um, when it gets a little bit warmer and try to find some really cool snakes that live around your area. And again, post those to iNaturalist. It's really fun to see um, all the observations and you can look up what is local to your area as well. See if you can and find those too. Um, so we do have reptile amphibian day t-shirts with the amazing, wonderful, cute marbled salamander on the backs of them. And it comes in all those fun colors and I kind of want one in every color. Um, if you are a member, thank you so much for being a friend of the museum. And um, if you are not a friend of the museum, then check it out online. Um, it comes with tons of benefits. If you join now during Reptile and Amphibian Day, then you actually get a free Reptile and Amphibian Day t-shirt. And um, we are just getting started. It is only Tuesday. We have programs all the way through Saturday. So go to naturalsciences.org and look at the upcoming programs that we have. Again, we hope to see you at some more programs and um, we hope that you enjoy the program today. Thank you guys so much. Thank you again, Bonnie. Thank you. Have a great day.